You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. should be over the things that happened to me. I'm to blame. It has to be my fault. Why else would it have happened? These are just a few of the statements many clients have said to author and mental health professional Kelly James over the years. Kelly James, the host of Why Aren't You Over This By Now, kept searching for something that would help her feel better after things that happened in her personal life. Finally, she found a way to heal her past in order to love her future and is here to share her discoveries and help the lives of others. So please welcome the host of Aren't You Over This By Now, Kelly James. Welcome to the show. This is Why Aren't You Over This By Now on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm Dr. Kelly James. I'm pretty excited today about my show and my guest, who is Kristen Hale. She is founder and owner of Connect and Restore Counseling Agency here in town. She is also a licensed professional counselor. She's board certified in neurofeedback. She's a registered play therapist. She's an infant mental health endorsed level three practitioner she's a trust-based relational intervention educator i just feel like i keep going on and on and on you are just so well trained so welcome to the show hey it's great to be here yes i'm i'm very excited to dig into all the things that you do because you are very well trained and so i'm excited for you to share with the audience um, about what you do and the success that you have doing it. So can we start by um, sharing your contact information? Yes. Um, my actual practice website is uh, www.connectandrestore, and it's just spelled out, C-O-N-N-E-C-T-A-N-D, and then the word restore, dot com. That is one way people can get a hold of me through the website. I also can be contacted at my office number, at 918-392-7988. And then, of course, my email, um, which is just my name, Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-E-N, and then at connectandrestore.com. And uh, like most people, I do all the things, email and phone and all of it. (laughs) Yes, we we are pulled in many different directions. So because you have such a varied interest and, you know, I feel like I have a lot of certifications and I think you exceed what I have. So this is exciting to me to find someone who's as obsessed as I am. Um, So can you share how you got into doing what you do? I would love that. Actually, I, I, I chuckled to myself when I hear my certifications read back to me because I was like, wow, I knew I liked learning, but I didn't realize I loved it that much um, when I hear my certifications. But, um, you know, my original career was an educator. I was a high school teacher, middle school and high school teacher. I was a coach and really kind of thought I would always just do that, always stay in the educational arena. Loved it, was a child of two teachers. Uh, but as I got further into my career, I realized that one of the things I really liked was the interaction with, with the students and really working with them on personal development, not necessarily just their academic development. And so uh, that led me back to grad school, and I decided to get a degree in school counseling at that point. Um, but I got, uh, went into a dual-track program that allowed me to get community-based counseling and started my career actually as a school-based counselor in a school in um, a fairly high poverty area here in Tulsa. And I was, I really loved that. I loved working with the kids. I loved working in collaboration with the school staff. And so uh, that was where I started my career and worked, of course, in community mental health for a long time and uh, started a nonprofit here in Tulsa uh, with a good co- a friend and colleague of mine. And uh, that nonprofit is still here today. It's a family hope house. They run, do amazing things, amazing work with the foster and adoptive community. Um, but I really, when I went out and off my own, in, um, on my own into private practice, 
um, I really started having a desire to bring some of those elements back in from my educational days uh, of, of that really that whole community coming around a student or, or a child. And so I realized that in order to do that, I was going to have to learn some stuff <laughs> that uh, my graduate degree was great. I loved my program, but um, I, I wanted to have more tools in my tool belt. And I was always kind of that teacher that if I, if I had a kid that wasn't performing in my classroom, wasn't learning, I would lay awake at night and try to figure out ways that I could help that kiddo. And so naturally that translated into into my counseling clients too if i wasn't making progress or they were not feeling like they were making progress or parents were not feeling like they were making progress i wanted more tools i wanted more knowledge and that really led me to the registered play therapy uh, and and did that and then of course the next logical step for me was some infant mental health the infant mental health enforcement um, so can you share what that actually is yeah, I know. I, I, it's funny. People ask me about it all the time, and they're like, okay, so what do you do with a baby when a baby comes in? Like, do they lay on the couch and just talk to you? Of course. No. The answer is no. Um, infant Mental Health is, is a, in a amazing uh, organization or, or amazing discipline. Uh, zero to three, the national organization of Zero to Three does a lot of work in this area. But Infant Mental Health is a very – specific set of training and requirements of knowledge in the age range of zero to five. Um, really also zero to three, but it extends all the way up to zero to five. And it centers around primarily working across disciplines, um, not just in the mental health field, but in educational communities and in daycare centers and, and with other types of providers, speech pathologists and occupational therapists. But it seeks to provide an environment that supports the healthy development of children, and so especially infants. And in, in the mental health field, we really work a lot with the infant and their caregiver because, of course, an infant is totally dependent on their caregiver. And so we work a lot with developing secure and healthy relationships with an infant and their caregiver. And so all our work in the infant mental health field is dyadic in nature. We're working not just with a child, an infant in the room by ourselves. We're working with that caregiver and that infant to create a healthy, strong relationship. And so why for our society is that important? You know, I, 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 people that know me because I taught high school say, okay, really? You work with little kids all day? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> the reason for that is because, uh, in my opinion, and there's lots of great reasons for it, but it's so preventative in nature, meaning that if we can start children off on the right foot, if we can start them off with healthy and secure relationships with parents who feel empowered to meet their children's needs in healthy ways, then we prevent a lot of the problems that end up causing mental health issues later in life. And so for me, it was a natural step in that I, I found myself wishing as I would see seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, wow, I wish I had known them um, when they were infants after hearing the story of what was happening in their lives at that time and in the lives of their parents at that time. Um, because, you know, raising children is hard and um, parents need a lot of support doing that. And starting with infants gives us the best chance to be able to do that preventative work that's so important. And I look at that because you and I are both registered play therapists. I look at that as if we do the preventative work and we really make sure that infants and families are healthy, that these are going to be the people that are running the country when I'm older and, you know, and I'm in old age, they're going to be running the country and I want them to be healthy. Right. <laughs> you know? right. We want them to be, be doing the things they need to do and be able to regulate emotion and all the things that we need healthy adults to be able to do. So, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, that's that's really a great um, tool. And I like the way you say that these are tools that you have that you use. Um, so how do you start that process when you're, you know, how do people know that they can get this service? Uh, well, I think that's one of the beautiful things about infant mental health work is there, it's very collaborative in nature. And what I mean by that is I have relationships with pediatricians here in town. Um, I, I am very regularly talking when I get a new family 
Um, even if they don't come in for a specific issue that involves a medical issue, I ask and get a release to talk to their pediatrician uh, because I like their pediatricians to know this is a service that's available. Uh, most of them don't. Um, a lot of them more and more are starting to, especially here in Oklahoma, our state has done a really good job with the Systems of Care Grant, uh, implementing infant mental health services across many disciplines and getting a lot of training. But I think that's what I always encourage clinicians that are interested in this work to understand is that it's not just you by yourself in the office, that you're working with every provider that's going to impact that child. And pediatricians are a great place to start. So I do a lot of that, and I do a lot of work um, in daycares when a child is mm. having an issue in daycare. Um, a lot of daycare providers aren't even aware that there are services available to help small children with behavioral and mental health needs. And so a lot of that community collaboration. And so I think um, based on what we had talked about previously is that a lot of this is from an attachment base. And when we come back from break, I kind of want you to share what an attachment therapy is and why is it beneficial. You are listening to Why Aren't You Over This By Now. I'm Dr. Kelly James, and you're listening on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And my guest today is Kristen Hell. She is a licensed professional counselor and founder and owner of Connect and Restore. We'll be right back. Master of words, powerful player. What life-changing words can Dr. Janet Smith-Warfield pull out of her magical toolbox that just might mysteriously open a door you never knew was there? A door to free yourself from fear forever. Transform your rage into right action. Release your guilt. Position you into a life of freedom, purpose, passion, power, and peace. All quite suddenly, unexpectedly, and almost miraculously, with no effort on your part. Join Dr. Janet every Monday at noon Eastern on Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom on the BBM Global Network as she and her guests show you how words map our experiences, immersing you in a sound bath that relaxes your muscles, opens your mind, and supports you in co-creating your extraordinary life. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick. Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation Welcome back to BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm Dr. Kelly James, and you're listening to Why Aren't You Over This By Now? If you have a question or comment for my guest, you can call in at 866-451-1451. And before break, um, I mentioned about how what you were talking about, about infant mental health, had to be based in attachment therapies. Can you explain what attachment therapies really mean? Or what they are. Sure. I think that's a really, I think that's a really good question. Um, of course, attachment is a very broad category, and we look at it across the lifespan because it informs all our relationships. But in specifically working with with infants or zero to five age range, we're looking for building attunement with between the parent and their child. So to give you a difference in, you know, if a child's having a behavioral issue. We're not just going to come in with a necessarily a strategy that addresses the behavior only. We're going to be curious and ask ourselves a lot of questions about what is this child needing in this moment? What's the need that this child has? And then teaching and helping parents to not only recognize the need, but then to meet it. And when a parent is consistently able to meet the needs of their child, they develop what's called a secure attachment 
which out of the four attachment styles that are out there is, is the ideal attachment style. It means that that infant securely understands that that parent is going to be available and able to meet their needs when they have them. And so they develop a sense of themselves as being safe in the world and their parents um, are, are safe people. And so they develop trust and um, security with that with that caregiver, which therefore extends into other relationships as they grow up. And in research, um, I believe it was Hanson in 1987, um, sh- his research showed that we parent the way we were parented. Mm-hmm. And so if parents don't know how to parent well then they're modeling poor parenting for their children who then you know grow up and have kids and are parenting from a poor standpoint so this is vitally important for everyone yes and you know one of the things that i love is a term that we use a lot in infant mental health called positive intentionality and it's this concept of that every parent is doing the very best they can with the tools they have at that particular time and so we really come at it from a strengths-based approach in trying to help a parent really recognize the things they are doing and that they are capable of meeting their child's needs um, clearly, there's our own stories as parents, and I'm a parent too, our own, our own history, like you said, we parent, like we were parented. But I think there's a lot of value in really coming into the therapy, a therapeutic relationship with a parent and an infant, understanding that, hey, this parent has their own story, and they're doing everything they know how to do to be a good parent, um, given their history and the tools that they have. And so we just expand their ability and build on the strengths they already have. Which is great because this isn't about judgment, about anything. It's about supporting parents to be better parents. So I think that's really great. So when we were talking before, you said there are three components of what your agency does, infant mental health being Mm -hmm. one of them. Can you share what another one is? Well, actually, it's a great segue because we just talked about parenting and how hard that is um, and how we have our own stories of parents. So one of the things I recognized early on in my work is that um, we would, in order to really, really serve children, we really needed to serve their parents. And there are lots of times in which a parent has their own story of, of a traumatic experience, traumatic childhood experience, or just difficult in attachment relationships as a child. And they need a space of their own to be able to work through those things and maybe clear up some of the narratives in their head about I'm not good enough or I'm not I'm not successful. I'm a failure. And because without knowing it, their child can actually trigger a little bit of those of those feelings. And so one of the things that we work on is working with parents and helping them resolve those those. Um, negative narratives and we use that primarily doing EMDR therapy and so I recognized early on that um, again I I have a lot of endorsements but I recognized I couldn't be good at all the things (laughs) and so I very quickly hired in um, two therapists uh, that were worked primarily with adults and families uh, that were able to really work the EMDR piece and so it is not uncommon in our practice for us to as a as a group, well not as a not all of us together, but if I'm intaking a person to really evaluate within my intake whether EMDR therapy might be a fit and then we recommend or talk about that from the very beginning and how that parent might benefit from that um, in order to be able to to do the other pieces of the work. And so we find, and of course um, I've, I have great people here that are very good at that and understand that, um, but we I find that parents and families in particular really enjoy the fact that they can be in one spot for their services and that, that they know that, with, of course, with their permission, that we will collaborate and, and talk about the best way to move their family forward to total, total healing. Now, I think that it's, it's a great model to have is to have all those services in one place. It, uh, the, it's coherent. It's, you know, I, I just think it's um, an excellent way to do treatment because, you know, you and I are both caregivers. We, we provide care. And like you said, you have all these endorsements and we're like, ooh, I could do that. And ooh, I could do that. And it's being able to see what your limitations are because, you know, we're 
we're only one person. So I really like that you have brought in other people to fill out that whole dynamic of the family. You mentioned you also have a marriage and family therapist on staff. We do. Um, we do. Of course, you know, again, we've been we've been open about three and a half years as Connect and Restore. And it started with just me. And of course, as I hired people on with this vision of becoming um, an integrated care clinic where we were working on more things, we started to recognize, wow, some of the family dynamic is maybe a marriage isn't in a great spot or a relationship isn't in a great spot or there are grandparents maybe that <laughs> that are factoring in. And so we're very quickly, we sat out to hire an excellent marriage and family therapist, and we're so blessed to get one. Um, she's wonderful and amazing and does a lot of our family, larger family work, especially with adults. So uh, we enjoy having that, that piece to the puzzle as well. That's, that's really great. And if I can go backwards, you talked about um, <clears throat> us having negative narratives and kind of core beliefs. Can you share briefly about how core beliefs are established so that people don't feel like they're, you know, something's wrong with them because they have these negative yeah. thoughts? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I always tell my clients, listen, everybody has some kind of negative core belief. We, that's just part of the human experience. Um, it depends on your story. Um, as to how those negative beliefs were established. And so, um, you know, I always use the example of, you know, for example, if you come from a highly per- performance-oriented household, which a lot of a lot of adults did, especially in the era that I grew up, where we were achievement-oriented and, um, you know, obey no matter what, um, which is <laughs> not a bad thing, but that was how it was. And so we, if you, I grew up with more of a perfectionist, like, oh, I'm not good enough. If I don't achieve certain things, I'm not good enough. And so that would be an example of a negative narrative. It doesn't mean I'm not good enough. It just means that my my tape in my head and the lens through which I look at things sometimes tells me, oh, you shouldn't do that. You're not good enough to do that. And so (laughs) when I recognized that that was just a product of my experience, and of course, through therapy and through all the things that that we do, we figure out what a healthier way of looking at that is. And so when I explain it to my clients, I explain it as there's an unhelpful thought and there's a helpful thought. You. So mm-hmm. it's not always helpful to think you're not good enough, but to think I'm I'm doing it the best I can, or I'm as I'm good, or I'm okay all by myself, or I'm okay regardless, um, is a more helpful thought to being productive and not not letting those those negative narratives take over. So, and you can heal the cause of that, and then choose to you know, work on and believe the positive one. It's it's just a great way to be able to go back and heal those negative core beliefs. So when we come back, we're going to hear another component of how Kristen works in her agency and the benefit. You are listening to Why Aren't You Over This By Now on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Kelly James. Be sure and stay tuned. We'll be right back. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various business interest through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. 
Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back to Why Aren't You Over This By Now? I'm Dr. Kelly James, and you're listening on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. My guest today is Kristen Hale, who is founder and owner of Restore and Connect. And she has so many endorsements that we're trying to cover them. So if we miss any, I'll, I'll have her fill in. And so before break, we talked about how you have like three different dimensions or aspects, components of, of how you um, see clients as um, a whole. And so we've talked about the infant mental health and EMDR. And what's the next area that you use? The next area is probably um, the one that I spend a lot of my time now because I have such qualified clinicians on staff. Uh, but I offer neurofeedback services. And uh, it, it was a journey for me to get to neurofeedback and a, a lengthy journey. But I, I really have um, enjoyed the, the benefits that neurofeedback can offer and in a nutshell, neurofeedback is just training the brain to function in a more optimal. Share about it with parents. I talk about um, that. You know, we do so much great work therapeutically, and we work with the thought processes and things that are so important in, in mental healing and, and wholeness. But there are certain parts of us that if we that if our brain can't do it, our brain can't do it. And so, one of the things that we work with, um, we work with anxiety, we work with depression, we work a lot with um, past traumatic experiences to help the brain calm itself so that therapeutic interventions are going to be more effective. And so, uh, we have a lot of success with it. We, there are lots of actually different kinds of neurofeedback. A lot, not a lot of people realize that. Uh, I see some education on that a lot. But we actually do about four different kinds of neurofeedback in my clinic, and we choose the right kind for the situation and for what that particular adult or child is needing. And so for us, the, the piece of adding neurofeedback um, to address the dysregulation in the brain directly has been very powerful in kind of fitting that last puzzle piece into the total integration of care um, to make their therapy more effective and to really help them get to a good place. Yeah, I really like that because the brain is a pattern seeking muscle. And so you were talking about training the pattern of the brain. You mentioned um, sympathetic overdrive and the autonomic nervous system. Can you kind of explain um, what that means for people who may not know? Right. So we all have in our autonomic nervous system, we have a sympathetic piece which revs us up. Um, that's where our fight or flight instinct comes. So I tell, as I explained it to my clients, if, a, if we're facing a bear and a bear is trying to attack us, our sympathetic is going to go into overdrive and is going to cause us either fight, flight, or uh, freeze. And then our parasympathetic is the one that balances out that sympathetic. So when the threat. So when we come back, we're going to be sharing more about her endorsements and how they benefit and what she does and the benefit for clients. You're listening on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm Dr. Kelly James, and you have been listening uh, to Why Aren't You Over This By Now? And my guest is Kristen Hale, and we will be right back. Be sure and stay tuned. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale. An international initiative called Nurse now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. 
Escape from Hell, A Woman's Story is a passionate book that tells the true story of author Rhonda Knudsen's journey through the darkness and adversity of abuse. The book takes readers on an emotional trail from the depths of despair to the heights of forgiveness and understanding. She was inspired to help others, and her book is a vital tool through this process. Faithful to God and devotional to her beacon of hope, Rhonda Knudsen is a perfect example of finding a guiding light that helped her come through the dark and into the light. Her book can assist you in overcoming your challenges with abuse. The publication of Escape from Hell, A Woman's Story, is a triumphant achievement, and it can help you take ownership of your own experience of abuse and come through stronger than before. Rhonda is currently working on two more books, Shadows of Corruption and Coast to Coast on a Piece of Toast. To read more about this inspiring author and purchase her books, visit RhondaKnutson.com or go to www.amazon.com. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the B. BBM Global Network. Welcome back to BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. You're listening to Why Aren't You Over This by Now. I'm Dr. Kelly James, and my guest today is Kristen Hale, who is a licensed professional counselor, among many other endorsements that we'll talk about in a little bit. But I want to ask, because you have an integrated agency, I want to, uh, could you kind of share beginning to end what that looks like when people are seeking um, looking for a therapist, what would they look for to know that they needed you and your agency? Yeah, I would love to. You know, I think we're in some ways we're a little typical in that an adult may come for services, uh, looking for just mental health services, or they may come to bring their child. Uh, but one of the things that we try to do very early on, and all my clinicians um, are very, very good at this, um, partially because we talk about it all the time and partially because they're all very well trained, but we talk a lot about um, looking at a case three-dimensionally, meaning that um, I get a lot of referrals. So if a, if a client has worked with, or if a therapist has worked with a, an adult client for a while, and for example, one of the main reasons they're in therapy is frustration over an interaction with a child, then we look at, okay, is it time to maybe look for some additional family work or some, some parent-child work, or maybe they're looking at, a child that's really dysregulated and they're having a hard time managing that. And so that's when we we work as a team to kind of figure out the best next step for that family. And so one of the things I do a lot of um, in my role as as the clinical director is I do a lot of consultation with uh, not only clients, just tell me a little bit about your story, um, So if but also my clinicians. So they'll ask me, is this child, this is what we've been doing in therapy, is this child a good candidate for neurofeedback services? Um, Is it worth doing a brain map to see if this child, you know, a good candidate for neurofeedback services? And so I'm so proud of the clinicians I have because I feel like they're very good at learning and starting to ask the right questions about how can we get this family down the road a little quicker um, to be able to to address the totality of what's going on instead of just continuing to work only one side of it over a long period of time. So we do a lot of that comprehensive um, approach. I also do it myself with a lot of individuals in the community. I have a very good relationship with an with a occupational therapist. I have a very good relationship with a couple of speech pathologists. And we do a lot of um, joint collaboration. Sometimes I even go to their office to work. Uh, I go to an OT's office and we'll work with a child together in session. Sometimes to figure out how we can, you know, if OT is not helping because the child's so dysregulated, then I help the OT learn how to regulate that child. So it's a lot of talking to other professionals. And one of the things I hear 
routinely from our families that is that it makes me really happy is that they say, I just feel like that we're addressing all the pieces, that no one's ever sat down and looked at all the different pieces. They've done a lot of different services in a lot of different places, none of which were bad services, but that when we finally sat down and looked at all the pieces of what was happening, we were able to move a little quicker down the road. And families in particular like the ability to tell their story one time. <laughs> Oh, and, definitely. And, and <laughs> yes. not have to rehash all the things that go on. So we we value that, and, and we do a lot of um, longer, a little longer intake. We do a lot of uh, asking a lot more questions, especially when we're looking at neurofeedback as a possible option about brain brain health and head injuries and some things, you know, along that line that would that would inform neurofeedback work. So. Well, and when I did um, worked with um, Dr. Bruce Perry, uh, his at the time his intake form was twenty four pages, mm-hmm. you, you know. And so, even though clients may get a little irritated, frustrated, annoyed with the length of a intake, this is to serve them better. The more information we have uh, from the beginning to where they are now, the better they can be served. So, um, yeah. part part of that. Do you use any type of assessments? I know you do for the neurofeedback, but what other do you use? Um, yes, I actually use um, a, test, a, a test for attention called the IVA, which is the variable, a variable attention test. It's a computerized test. Um, I actually work with that with kids a lot. Uh, I get a lot of children with diagnoses of ADHD that um, may or may not have true ADHD. Sometimes it's anxiety, sometimes it's other things going on. And so um, I like to use those those computerized CPTs that, um, you know, performance tests that just help us kind of isolate, well, is this something that really is ADHD or is it better explained by anxiety? Um, and then we use uh, all kinds of assessments, infant mental health in particular, um, has the parental stressors index. It has um, a whole lot of assessments that we use. And so it's one of those things that in, in our initial intake, I tell parents a lot. And I prep my clients to say, I'm going to spend some time at the beginning getting a lot of information because if I don't, um, it'll, it'll, or if I do, it'll shorten your time that you're here. If I, if I get ahead of it and know what I'm, what I'm talking about before, then it's going to feel a little frustrating maybe to, to feel like you're spinning your wheels a little bit. But usually by the end, they, they very much feel like um, in that final review session after I've done a lot of assessing and I sit back down with a family and say, this is what we'd recommend. How do you feel about that? Most of the time they say, this is great. This is what I think exactly is happening and this is what we need. And then they have a plan to go forward. And sometimes that's not starting here. Um, with a child, sometimes I'll say, hey, you need to go do speech pathology. You know, his frustration is that nobody can understand him. And so <laughs> let's start, spend some time in speech and see if that resolves. So it's not just about um, giving them services here. It's about finding the, the right path for them. Right. An example of that is um, when I first started in full-time private practice, you know, I did a decent intake, I thought. Um, mm-hmm. I, since then, it is a little different, but I'd been working with this child who had certain behaviors and the behaviors just weren't improving. And, you know, I was doing play therapy and all of a sudden one day the mother identified some behaviors and I was like, oh my gosh, she never told me that, that mm-hmm. you need occupational therapy that is Uh right and so referred them there and then after that they came back and finished out and and the child got better because I missed a piece so you being able to do that extensive intake is very valuable so can you share briefly about ADHD and trauma and how their symptoms mimic each other yes well, I was actually, um, I'm actually fortunate enough right now to be doing some training with a, with a university here um, in, in West Virginia where they're really working on some of the newer cutting-edge strategies for diagnosis of ADHD. And so I'm learning a lot uh, as we speak because, you know, I am a learning junkie. Um, I love learning. <laughs> um, but um, I am really starting to recognize that ADHD, the symptoms of ADHD cross over with so many other things. And so, for example, if a child, we talked about the sympathetic nervous system, if a child has been traumatized, then their sympathetic nervous system lives on overdrive, and so they're not able to sit still, which is an ADHD symptom. 
And we'll share more about that when we come back. You're listening to Why Aren't You Over This By Now on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Be sure and stay tuned to hear how ADHD and trauma interact with each other. Renaissance woman, trailblazer, maverick. Those are just some of the words to describe to Chandra Poulard, owner and CEO of House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC, a woman minority veteran owned entertainment company based in Washington, D.C. Ms. Poulard served 10 years honorably in the United States Navy and departed from active duty to pursue her dreams of becoming an entertainment mogul. House of Virgo Entertainment offers script writing, producing, directing, DJ services, editing, and more. They cater to businesses, corporations, college students, working professionals, aspiring artists and nonprofit organizations, and employ veterans of the armed forces. Tashandra Poulard is pioneering the way we view media and taking her brand global. Visit her at www.houseofvirgoentertainment.com or call 281-515-3740 and like her on Facebook at House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact a symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. Welcome back to the show. Why aren't you over this by now? I'm Dr. Kelly James, and you're listening on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And before the break, uh, Kristen was talking about how ADHD symptoms and trauma symptoms mimic each other. And so you can finish sharing that so people can be aware that there might be something more than just ADHD. Right, right. And ADHD is super real. I mean, definitely we see true ADHD cases. Um, But especially with a child who has any kind of background of trauma, um, we really look at how their sympathetic nervous system is responding. So are they in that that level of elevation of of, um, sympathetic overdrive where the ADHD symptomology of not being able to sit still, impulsive, interrupting, are those things best or better explained by a background in trauma where their sympathetic nervous system is on overdrive? And so a lot of times we will um, work when we, especially when we work with the family in trust-based relational intervention, those strategies are strategies that we work with with kids to help the parents use parenting strategy to calm down and address the traumatic experiences and the traumatized brain and then of course we come into neurofeedback as I said um, also to work with that as well and to calm that sympathetic and then lots of times those those um, things that look like ADHD look, resolve themselves when we're addressing that the, the brain has just been traumatized. Yep, that's that's great. Okay, you and I both have tons of endorsements. And so can you share why that is important? And if someone is looking for a clinician, what to look for? And and why those endorsements are important to be looking for? Yes, I would love to. I think a couple of things about that, just about the way we do things in our clinic. Um, I value endorsements because An endorsement says that you have gone through a process to learn enough as, you know, of course, an independent body is saying what enough is, uh, but to learn enough to be very confident, um, a minimum level of confidence at at that particular strategy or skill. And so when a a client is looking for EMDR therapy, for example, um, and they're, they're coming here, I'm, I'm going to be very transparent with them about, I have some EMDR training, 
that I am not EMDR certified. That's an endorsement. We do have somebody here that has that endorsement. And then I talked to them about the difference in what that training is. But I've had a couple of workshops. She actually has had lengthy training um, in this and um, give them that, that power to make that choice about what, what they would prefer to do. And I, I, will, I feel like my clinicians, um, it's important to me that they pursue what they feel like they want to be endorsed in. And so they don't have to have everything, but we work really hard to pull in people when we're interviewing new staff, to pull in people that complement this integrated care part. What do we not have? What do we need? Um, and then how can we um, empower people to do their thing and not any one of us has to be an expert in everything. I realized very early on that if I was going to be very competent in neurofeedback that I was going to have to do less investment in other things mm -hmm. because you cannot be good at everything. And so um, I had to make some choices. And so I encourage not only my clinicians to really hone in on what they feel like they're, they're good at and what they want to pursue, but then also to um, do that myself and, and know that I cannot be good at, at everything and, and encourage clients to find competent, you know, professionals that have reached that minimum level of competence whenever possible. Yeah, and I, you know, especially because my love for play therapy is if you need a child therapist, you need one who has the minimum of a registered play therapist. And there's also registered play therapist supervisors. But that tells you that they have spent a significant amount of time learning what they need to learn. It's so important. So. I was curious about what specific issues does your agency handle? You know, um, we, we handle a lot, almost everything, really, from um, birth to um, older age. I actually train adults that are, that are struggling with memory and different things. I work with them in neurofeedback and, um, I, you know, different life things, even, even therapeutically. So we have clients of all ages here. And it's one of the things I really love about what we do. Um, I also feel like that um, we work a lot with, of course, trauma because all of my staff, it's a minimum requirement for my staff to at least do the basic EMDR training. That does not mean they're all certified, but I require, and I, and I help them with the financial obligation of that to pay for part of that training so that they are able to do that. It's so integral to what we do here. Um, and so I, we see a lot of trauma. We get a lot of referrals for trauma. Um, we also get a lot of referrals for tougher kid cases, tougher kids who, who have really struggled with behavior or they've kind of, kind of a, a the situation where we tried a lot of things and we don't know what else to do um, a lot, um, which are more complex, but uh, through the integrated care model, we're able to work, I think, pretty effectively with those, those cases. Yeah. It, you mentioned something that um, I just want to say, I feel like... I need to say this, but with all these endorsements, these things aren't cheap. Um, I, I, I hesitate, I don't think I would ever do it, is calculate or add up how much I have spent on endorsements over the years. <laughs> but, you know, EMDR training is not cheap. It, yeah. None of this is inexpensive. So when you have a clinician that has an endorsement, it means they are very invested in this instead of just, we don't just show up at a workshop that's free and, you know, say, whoo, -hoo, we're endorsed. No, we've spent a significant amount of time, money, and effort to learn what we need to learn to help people. Right. Right. And as an employer and as a person who wants my people to really put that investment forward, if they are interested and willing to spend the time, as much as I'm able, I like to help them with that financial obligation because it, it benefits our clinic as a whole for them to have those options to be able to do that. Now, that is a great model to do because, you know, I've worked for agencies and, you know, everything was out of pocket. So, yeah, that's really great that you are willing to do that. 
So when we come back from our break, I do want you to share briefly about your clinicians and just kind of share of who they are and what they specialize in. So when we come back, Kristen will share about that. You're listening on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm Dr. Kelly James, and you're listening to Why Aren't You Over This By Now? The call-in number is 866-451-1451 if you have any questions for her in this last segment. So we will be right back. French Rastafarian baker Chef Oug Mat is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Chef Ouvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Ugmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefoug.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. Global Glory, that's the work of Dr. Marina McLean, COO of Global Glory, whose calling is to serve God. A first-generation British-born Londoner of Jamaican descent, Dr. McLean inherited the hunger for the word from her father, who was a Bible teacher. Growing up, her home was filled with missionaries from the Caribbean islands and America, and she travels the world preaching the gospel. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology and an honorary doctorate of divinity and Christian counseling from Friends International Christian University. Dr. McLean is also a songwriter and recording artist, and her songs are written during summits and conferences in the presence of God. She's recorded three worship albums to date and is in ministry for 28 years alongside her husband, Dr. Rennie McLean, who shares her passion. Visit www.globalglory.org or on Facebook at Global Glory. Call 866-244-5679 and feel the glory. French Rastafarian baker Chef Oug Mat is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Chef Ouvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Ugmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefoug.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. Welcome back to Why Aren't You Over This by Now on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm Dr. Kelly James, and my guest today is Kristen Hale. And Kristen, I wanted you to share about your clinicians and who they are and what they specialize in. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'm so blessed by the team that I have here. Um, I actually have uh, Lindsay Berryman, who is a uh, registered play therapist herself. She is EMDR certified. Uh, she's also a TBRI educator, that trust-based relational intervention educator. Um, Lindsay has particular background in trauma and is our resident go-to trauma, EM, all things EMDR. Uh, and so we're very grateful to have her. I also have Dawn Brandenburg, and Dawn is, um, have been, has been a clinician for 20 years. She's a fabulous clinician, um, is also EMDR trained. Uh, a particular thing about Dawn, she works beautifully with adults and teens, but a particular thing um, about her, um, of course, she's a LPC and a supervisor and all those things and has a wealth of experience, but she is also what's called a SING group facilitator. Um, she has special expertise in the needs of the highly and profoundly gifted population and is phenomenal at working with that population has been very invested for lots of years at working with special mental health needs that come with that population. 
Uh, and so she does some work surrounding that as well. Uh, I also have uh, Rachel Henry, and Rachel is our LMFT. Uh, she came to us as a transplant from the Tennessee area, and we were super excited to get her. She is our marriage and family therapist, but she also has an undergraduate degree in art, so she uses a lot of expressive arts therapy, and is phenomenal with class. Um, and then I have Jordan Gustin, who works for me part-time, who has special expertise in children. She's an LPC and a supervisor, some background in domestic violence type services, and so, um, and is infant mental health trained as well. Um, and then I have two LPC candidates that are um, uh, pursuing board certification in neurofeedback as well as their LPC license, nice. and they work with me doing neurofeedback. So. What a great team. I, I like having students because then you get to raise them the way you want them <laughs> yes, <laughs> to, yes, you yes, know. Yes. And yeah. they get to be, you know, really fabulous therapists that way. Yeah. Okay. It, anything else you would like to leave the audience with? Uh, no, I just really am so grateful to be able to talk about this. I feel like that um, I, the, this integrated model is really working well for families and, and children. And I, I think the collaboration in the community, especially with other professionals, is um, so important, and I, what I hear from my families is just how relieved they are uh, to find a place that would pull all the puzzle pieces together. And so I encourage even solo clinicians to go out and, and take the extra step to call the pediatrician, take the extra step to talk to the teacher, um, take the extra step to get feedback that makes that child or that individual more three-dimensional um, if you're able to get um, more information because it really is a game changer. Well, because we don't end up the way we are in a bubble. I mean, we have interacted with family and friends that have created the issues in our life. And so you have to have that three-dimensional piece. Yes. So I just want to thank you so much for being on the show. I knew of you. I didn't know you. Um, and so I'm really thankful that you were able to come and share what your agency does. Well, I appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Yes. All right. That's the show. You've been listening on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio to Why Aren't You Over This By Now? I'm Dr. Kelly James, and we will be back next week. And thanks again, Kristen, for sharing with the audience. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to Why Aren't You Over This By Now? with your host, Kelly James. Kelly says, the truth is that we all have things that happen in our lives. We all have stuff. You can live life the way you want. Tune in each week and discover that there's hope for healing your past beyond traditional talk therapy. Right here on Kelly James's Why Aren't You Over This By Now? been listening to the bbm global network the ideas views and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas views and opinions of the bbm global network company